Next up, please help me welcome Mr. Ken Hoffman, one of the experts for McKinsey's Basic Materials Institute, BMI. Ken is widely sought after for his engaging talks about the industry trends, and we're very lucky to have him with us this morning. Also with us is Mr. Terry Ortslin from TSO and Associates, who will say a few words of introduction on behalf of Ken. Terry? Thank you, Joanne. It's a pleasure being here again and introduce our speaker from McKinsey from the United States, Ken Hoffman. If you YouTube him, his name, he has dozens of interviews and speeches. He's a very busy person nowadays. Uh, he's for ex Bloomberg, came to McKinsey a few years ago, senior partner, co head of the EV battery division, heavily quoted. You'll see him literally in most literature when you pursue, and we thank him to come all the way from the United States to give this presentation before to go to the next meetings. Ken. Thanks a lot, Terry. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, the world of EVs um, and how we actually can get from a world of internal combustion engines to a world of EVs. Used to be I would talk a lot about what needs to happen in order for the world to decarbonize and to go to electric vehicles. Um, those days are done. The tipping point has already occurred. The world will go all EVs. And so that's really important for the mining industry because the amount of materials needed to go all electric is just absolutely staggering. So let's go through, I'd like to go through and talk a little bit about the industry, why we think the tipping point was reached last year and why things need to change an awful lot because you got a lot of automotive companies in North America who want to buy their material locally. They're really struggling to figure out how to do that. And uh, it's going to take a lot of effort from the mining industry to do just this. First off, what do people want in an electric vehicle? Um, we do a lot of surveys of consumers around the world. And, and one of the interesting things I find is uh, it doesn't matter whether that EV user is, is here in Canada or in the United States or in Japan or China or Europe. Um, it's, and it sounds pretty silly after the fact when you think about it, but you ask them, what do you want in an electric vehicle? And they always say every single time, we want something that does the same that our internal combustion engine does. We want the same range. So we want a range of six to 900 kilometers. We want to recharge it or refuel it in the same amount of time. So we're talking three to five minutes. And for a long time, I think this industry sort of tried to dazzle us with science saying, well, actually you only need this many miles of range. And actually you really don't mind if you charge it overnight. But the consumer again and again said, no, that's, that's not acceptable. And what's interesting is the one company who has done quite well in this space, as we all know, is Tesla. They seem to get this. They always had the longest range vehicles and they always had the fastest recharge times of any vehicle out there. And spending a lot of time looking at new battery technologies and what's coming down over the next few years, we're going to get there. We're going to actually get to a car that has 600 to even 1,000 kilometers range and can be recharged within minutes, not hours. And that's really important because that tells us what type of metals we're going to need to get us to that point in time. Last year, EV sales globally rose by more than 100% to about 6.7 or 6.75 million units globally, representing more than 7% of all uh, vehicle sales globally. What has been interesting is as soon as you hit around 8% in every country, you immediately hit this hockey stick. So what we found in China, in Germany, obviously Norway, which is the poster case, but France, the UK, and, and many countries, as soon as they hit around 8%, they take off um, crazy. Uh, Germany is talking about 30% penetration rates. Most of Europe is in that 20 to 30% uh, penetration rate. China is above 30% penetration rate. Of course, countries like Norway are 100% EV penetrated at this point in time. We're waiting for North America, which has slowly but surely been moving up, to also hit that. And with dozens and dozens of new models that will hit the market over the next 
a couple of years, the US will also hit this hockey stick much like the rest of the world. Now this presents a problem for governments because one of the things that goes on when you go to an electric vehicle is you, you need far fewer jobs. Um, electric vehicles just don't have a lot of parts. So how can a government try to ensure that as many jobs as possible are retained um, while still moving <clears throat> to a uh, renewable future? And so one of the ways to do that is localization. And that is one of the reasons why you know, mining, particularly mining in Canada, is going to be crucial to keep those jobs, to keep that material in a world that can be politically unstable, local. <clears throat> Overall demand is going to grow immensely. Um, and last year we, we saw about um, a half a terawatt of batteries produced in the world. Um, the world consumes, if we wanted to go 100% uh, battery for everything from stationary storage to pieces of equipment to electric vehicles, you would need around 20 terawatts a year to be produced. So we were about half of that, half of one terawatt last year. And the numbers were at around four terawatts for 2030. Although I must say this number, every time it's published every six months, goes up substantially. Um, Tesla does believe by 2030 that we will see 20 terawatts uh, of demand. In terms of materials and the materials that we need, um, you can see that um, uh, the growth is going to, right now, it's all China, uh, but it's gonna start to move elsewhere around, uh, particularly to North America and Europe. And so we will continue to see sort of this expansion. And again, this is another chart that as we update it year after year, um, we're seeing a much faster uh, growth in terms of Europe and North America towards uh, the making of cells and the making of batteries. And so I fully expect North America to always grow faster than what you think, not slower. In terms of the investments needed, uh, at least 700 billion US needs to be invested in this industry in order for us to meet these goals. And that's just to get to four terawatts. When we start talking about 20 terawatts, you're talking trillions of dollars of investment. And so that's, that's something that just sort of staggers the mind in terms of what's going on. Recycling will be interesting in this industry. You'll often hear, well, why don't we just recycle this material? Why do we have to mine it? And the plain truth is <laughs> there's nothing to recycle these days. Um, a, an electric vehicle battery lasts uh, 10 years, <clears throat> if not longer. A battery is considered in a vehicle, quote unquote, dead when it has uh, around 80% of its capacity left. And so in many instances, what we can see is those batteries um, can be reused for some other purpose. And so those batteries could be in the market for 20, 30 years before they actually hit a recycling stream. One of the things we're working with, with recycling companies about is, uh, and, and what they're focused on is government regulation. Um, there is a push already in Europe to have a minimum amount of recycled material by 2025 and 2030 in new batteries. Um, and so that's something uh, interesting. Um, and that could help the industry get a premium for their product as we're actually seeing today for things like green, lithium, or green steel uh, and green uh, aluminum. But still at the end of the day, know this, a EV battery today cannot be recycled. No matter what you see on TV, no matter all the companies you read about, commercially, the best we can do is we throw it in, in a traditional furnace, we melt it down and we can get out the nickel, the cobalt and the manganese. Today, the lithium is not recycled. The graphite anode is not recycled. The electrolyte is not recycled. The separator is not recycled. So you can get the copper separator or the copper foil on one side, you can get the aluminum foil and you can get that cathode material, but the rest of it is just either burnt off or landfilled. The one battery you'll hear often about in the press is a, is a battery called LFP. And LFP had a huge year last year, it went up 170% in terms of global production. Um, the good news was LFP has no base metals in it. Um, the reason it came through uh, such a huge growth phase last year was, number one, metal prices went up considerably, particularly nickel. Uh, number two, uh, the Chinese came up with a new technology. Um, 
virtually all new advancements in battery chemistry and, and battery technology up until this point have occurred in China. Um, I would put the, the Koreans sort of behind them, the Japanese sort of behind them, the Europeans behind them, and then North America bringing up the rear so far. Um, but one of the things the Chinese did was we tear down about a dozen batteries a year from a dozen, a dozen different vehicles. We want to know the copper content. We want to know what the, the welds are made of. We want to know all the different systems. And we want to actually break that cell down in a lab under a microscope to see exactly what are in those cells. One of the things we found was LFP um, chemistry, the amount of chemicals in an LFP battery three years ago when you took that entire pack out of the vehicle it was only about 40 or 45 percent chemicals. The rest was sort of packing and, and thermal management and, and uh, things to sort of uh, shock absorb, et cetera. But two companies in China, BYD and CATL, found that they could do the same thing and put almost double the amount of chemicals into the exact same spot. So today's LFP batteries and, and a technology called blade technologies, you can put double the amount of chemicals in the same space. And so even though LFP chemistry, and I have a chart showing a little bit of this, doesn't have the greatest density, and so density gives you range, if I can put double in the same spot, I can make that battery work. And so LFP actually came roaring back last year, and a lot of people believe it's going to be uh, an important factor going forward, and we do as well, although it cannot really give you all of what that consumer wants, which is that range and that recharge time. And the other thing is LFP batteries are 99% landfilled. They cannot be recycled because there's nothing valuable to take out of them. So there's always a, a bit of a caveat to every, every way you go down to a story. This is a, and, and I'm more than happy to send these slides to anybody who, who is interested. Um, this is sort of the way battery technology sort of goes. And if you start at the, uh, the far left, you, you can start with say a lead acid battery. A lead acid battery has an energy density of about 30 to 50 watts per kilo. Um, LFP batteries we were talking about quite a bit better. They, they can get densities of 160 to 180 watts per kilo. So how much energy, that gives you the range that you want. Um, if we look at companies like, uh, like uh, Volkswagen or Tesla, they are using high nickel batteries in their cars. Those can have much, much higher densities on the order of 260 to 290 watts per kilo. And so again, the, one of the reasons why you've seen virtually every new um, uh, cell plant being built in North America, at least announced to date, they're all high nickel batteries. And all of the ones in Europe, except for two, um, are high nickel batteries. And that's about 100 new cell facilities in North America and Europe that are planned on being built. They probably all aren't built, but they're all um, high nickel batteries. And so that's giving you that density you want. It gives you the range that your consumer wants, but it's an awful lot of nickel. <clears throat> if we try to figure out the numbers, last year on 6.7 million vehicles, the world needed about 300 to 325,000 metric tons of nickel. So if you look at about an 80 million vehicle market and you multiply it out, that's a lot of nickel. Um, cobalt, interestingly, is being weaned out of batteries. In fact, we used to have about 33% of the, the chemistry weight was cobalt. Um, today, it's only about 3 to 5%. And, so, and, and many new uh, technologies out there actually take the cobalt out completely. The one metal that's sort of rising besides nickel in the cathode chemistry is manganese. Interesting about manganese, and we, we talk to a lot of clients about this, um, there's only one place to buy battery-grade manganese for, to make a cell, and that's China. There are four pilot plants being built or running outside of China, but there's no commercial operations that can make a purity of the manganese for a battery. And that's probably one of the things when we do talk to mining companies about supplying materials to the battery industry, it, it gets a, a little confusing in that this is a specialty chemical and that specialty chemical can only be made by a few players. And as you supply the EV industry, those auto kit makers are going to have people in your mind because the, the slightest detriment means an awful lot to that chemistry. As a matter of fact, when you start up a cell plant, you'll have a 30% yield loss for the first year to year and a half, worst case scenario. A well-run cell plant still has five to 8% yield loss. So when people talk about recycled material, 90% of all recycled material outside of China comes from the cell plant waste. Uh, they, 
that they just can't make it work. And when we go and we figure out, well, why do they have such a high yield loss? It's almost always due to the materials being used, the raw materials. So I've been with a bunch of miners and, and they just start laughing because they're like parts per billion of certain detriments to keep it under these levels. And that spec is going to change every three months. It really starts to make their head spin and you find out why uh, most of these companies have to go to China to find this material. You may mine it in the West, but it all goes for final refining to China before it comes back. That's becoming less and less acceptable, and so you're starting to hear a lot of efforts being made, particularly in Europe and North America. How can we put these refining capabilities to make such an ultra-pure material for the battery industry? Now, going forward, um, we're going to see, we spent a lot of time over the last 10 years tweaking the cathode material. So you've seen a move towards higher and higher nickel, but now we're at you know, the GM multi and batteries over 90% nickel. There's, there's almost so much nickel you can put into it. Um, we are seeing moves towards a high manganese battery. A uh, company in China called Asphalt has a 25% manganese, 75% nickel battery. So they've taken some of the nickel out and they still get good density. They have no cobalt. Um, and so that, that's quite a bit cheaper. But what, you're, what you hear in the press today is sort of the move to the anode. Anode today is a graphite material, usually with three to 6% silicon added. Um, but what you'll hear these phrases called solid state battery, which is a horrible phrase actually. What we're trying to do is change the anode material. And there's two ways to improve the anode material. One is to use silicon. Silicon is far, far lighter than graphite um, and can hold 10 times the amount of electrons uh, than, than graphite. But silicon has a big problem in that when it's filled with electrons, it's like a balloon. It expands 400%. And that expansion and contraction of the silicon breaks apart the battery. And so that's one thing people are trying to solve. The best material in a battery for a lithium ion cell is lithium. So you actually use a thin sheet of lithium, ridiculously light down to as low as we've heard three microns. Um, and lithium in the battery would rather travel to lithium than anything else, so incredibly efficient. And how do I have a lithium metal anode? The first thought was I need something called the solid state battery because lithium um, just degrades very, very fast. And so how do I get a car that's going to last me, you know, a half a million kilometers and that battery is going to last? Lithium metal in today's battery wouldn't last 10 kilometers. It just falls apart almost instantaneously. So the thought was, well, how can I really hold that lithium in there so it doesn't degrade? And solid state was thought to be a way to do it where you put a solid on one side, a lot of pressure on the other, keep that lithium just completely tightly wound in there and it can't degrade. But there are new technologies called semi-solid state, which don't use solids, but they use a polymer around that lithium metal. And that's how we do that. With lithium metal, you can start to talk of densities double today's batteries. And then there are actually batteries out there we call lithium sulfur, which talk about triple today's density, but they seem a little bit further down the line. Needless to say, every one of these batteries uses lithium. Most of these batteries use nickel, cobalt, and manganese, and some use a lithium phosphate, that LFP battery out there. So which battery wins? A lot of batteries win. Um, when you actually look at applications for batteries, there's many different needs. There's some batteries need power. Some batteries need long-term uh, durability. Some batteries need to work in very cold climates. Some batteries don't need to worry about being in cold climates. So all these different factors come into, and cost becomes really important, range becomes really important. From doing a forklift, an LFP battery is perfect for you. It will give you everything that you want out of that battery. Um, if I'm looking at some sort of heavy mining machinery, and a lot of mining companies come to us, how can we completely decarbonize our mine site? Because those OEMs, which have to pay a very heavy carbon tax, need every bit of the mining process mapped out and the carbon content. How can I actually take carbon out? How can I, how can I have a train that's electric? How can I have my forklifts or my, 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 my shovels and my, uh, all my machinery sort of made electric? Uh, for that, you need super dense batteries. And so there will be a whole sort of Christmas tree view of all the different chemistries out there. Um, and, and these will change over time. Now, where does this leave us? Um, it leaves us needing an awful lot of material. Um, lithium, we're actually, as a firm, we're not too worried about. Um, there is plenty of lithium in the world. Um, the, 
even though last year we probably used about 550,000 metric tons of lithium, up from 150,000 metric tons of lithium three years earlier, um, we could need as much as three, four, even five million metric tons of lithium by 2030. The world can do that. The world could do 20, 30 million tons of lithium a year. The issue is how do we actually process and refine that material? That is the bottleneck. And so one of the things we, it, it doesn't take very long to get some lithium operations up and running, depending if it's brine or if it's hard rock. Um, however, we do think the world, while it will be a very volatile price for lithium, the world will have the lithium that we need. Nickel is a problem um, because only what we call class one nickel can be used for batteries. It cannot be a ferro nickel. It must be sort of an LME grade nickel and even that needs to be refined a bit. Um, and there's not much of class one nickel uh, out there, particularly if we want to see growth. As I said, around 300, 325,000 metric tons of nickel uh, was used last year of about 1.7, 1.8 million metric tons of class one nickel. So we could grow considerably in terms of using up class one nickel, but it will come out of stainless steel. And the stainless steel industry is, is going to have to go through a massive shift in terms of how it is able to, uh, to make stainless steel without class one nickel or with very little class one nickel. Um, and um, you know, we do see a lot of new nickel facilities coming online in Indonesia, particularly HPAL. Um, those, uh, as we know, HPAL plants um, have never been very easy to get up and running. Um, they always seem to have massive cost overruns and they never or rarely seem to run at nameplate capacity. So that will be a problem. Um, we're not very fond of some of these ideas we hear out there where, where people want to sort of use a, a, uh, an RKEF to make uh, nickel and then put it through a heavy sulfur uh, process. That's an old Russian process that I know Tin Shan has talked about. We, we think from an ESG standpoint that, that just won't fly very well. Um, ocean mining is something I would have thought a year ago completely impossible, but at every conference I go to you hear more and more and more about the potential of ocean mining. On an ESG standpoint, the jury is out, um, but it is something that I think um, is becoming talked about more and more as the amounts of material just become so immense. Will we have enough material at all? We often get the question, particularly from oil companies who sort of want to make, want to make this nightmare go away for them, um, will we have enough materials? We will. Um, we will continue to see this movement of materials um, going away from cobalt. Remember cobalt a few years ago, the price at 100,000. A lot of people in the cobalt industry said, oh, this is the new normal, prices are gonna stay this high. And then prices promptly collapsed because the chemist realized that they could take the cobalt out of the battery. Um, nickel prices have soared as well, um, even though the nickel market today is a little bit broken, but we're finding ways to take nickel out of the chemistry. Um, lithium is the one that will uh, be almost impossible for the industry to take out. Uh, but again, the amount of lithium in the world is quite abundant. Wherever you find an old dead ocean, you will find a lot of lithium and there's a lot of old dead oceans around the world. So um, we will be able to process that. And it's just a matter again, making the investments in, in, in refineries and production technologies and some technological changes. I'll be heading next week to Phoenix to speak at a lithium conference talking about new lithium production uh, technologies. There's quite a few of them out there and some of them are very, very promising. Uh, and manganese will be a, a metal you'll be hearing more and more about. Um, again, the processing of that manganese needs to be solved and CapEx needs to be spent, but manganese will become sort of the offset to nickel to try to stretch those nickel supplies out long-term. But we do think overall, we will have the material that we need to get us to a decarbonized future. Um, I quickly just wanted to, and again, happy to, have, I know these are busy slides. There are an awful lot of, uh, of new lithium tech or battery technologies. You can see how they really take up the density of the batteries, and there's a lot of people looking at this. So um, we often get who wins. There could be several winners out there, um, but there is a number of different ways to, to, to treat this technology. Um, you know, just even in silicon alone, there's I think six different types of silicon uh, 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 anode technologies out there, all completely different from one another. All claim that they're going to be the, the latest and the greatest that take us to where we need to be. Um, but you'll see here, there's an awful lot uh, out there that are they're super interesting. And so the money is being spent, the batteries are getting better, 
the tests are being done and look for these to be in your vehicle in the next two to three years. What's interesting, I think, from, a, from an investment standpoint is used to be able to say the automotive industry took seven years to sort of this product cycle. Um, because of Tesla, today's that, that product cycle is four years. So they've almost shaved in half the time to market for vehicles. And so vehicles are becoming much more like your iPhone. There's going to be very, very, very rapid evolution. And you're going to go from your beeper to your pager to your Blackberry to your iPhone super fast. Uh, and uh, winners and losers in the marketplace will, will come and go quite rapidly. These again, and, and I just wanted to put in sort of the, the ways to, that people are trying to go after uh, lithium metal. Um, and, and lithium metal, there, there's three different ways of this. Again, I just want to showcase that, um, that, that there are a lot of technologies out there. And so people are like, well, if QuantumScape doesn't work, this, bad, this industry doesn't work. And you realize there's 50 companies out there with different ideas than QuantumScape. So I'm not sure which of the 50 win, but enough of them seem pretty close to cracking the nut that some of them will come to market and be very, very successful. Now, what does the mining industry do about this? I spend all day talking to OEMs who are begging me to try to convince the mining industry to produce more metals. Um, and so these are the three options we generally give them. Um, to do equity investment, a joint venture, or a direct investment. Um, OEMs generally will always tell you they don't want to get into the business of mining. Um, they don't want any potential whatsoever that if something goes wrong at that mine, they are tainted. So they want to, on the one hand, have access to that material, but on the other hand, don't want to be responsible for that mining of that material. So what are they doing today is sort of the middle column, long-term supply agreement. Any OEM, I could sign, if you say I have a giant nickel mine or a lithium facility, I could sign up an offtake agreement in 10 seconds. Um, but that doesn't really do the mining company well. For, for the most sense, it's, it's junior miners that really need the capital and an offtake agreement. Um, while it may hold their equity in a short term, particularly if I put the name Tesla in front of that offtake agreement, I st my equity price will have a very nice day, it doesn't really help me with that project. So the one thing that we've been talking a lot to clients to consider is a streaming arrangement. A streaming arrangement uh, is normally done in, in the gold industry. Um, it's been done in silver and some other industries. But for the EV industry, a streaming arrangement could be very interesting. It would be an upfront payment to a mining company to develop that project. And then it would be a long-term fixed price contract, which the OEMs are desperate to look for. And then the kicker would be any excess material in addition to that uh, to that offtake agreement that would be part of the streaming arrangement. But we think that is a way that junior miners can work together with OEMs to sort of make this work at the end of the day and to sort of get us to where we need to be. This won't be easy and we do need government help. Uh, I know um, when I'm talking to miners, I'm preaching to the choir, but governments need to streamline uh, environmental permits. There needs to be uh, ways to sort of get to market quicker. Um, as uh, you know, when we talk to folks, it's the only way we can do this is, is the mining industry. And when I argue and debate with, with people who say, you know, we can recycle, there's no material to recycle. There was 10 years ago, there was less than 40,000 AVs sold. Most of those vehicles are probably in a museum someplace. So there's nothing to recycle except for cell plants that are currently producing. And people say they're against mining. We always tell them, you know, 90% of everything that you look at has either been mined or forested. So it's got to come from the mining industry. And then my final argument, it always, I always trump these folks is, if you don't believe in mining, then you don't believe in global warming because there can't be the two, one without the other. The mining industry will be the industry that solves global warming. And I think together as a group, we can all help to do this. So anyways, I'm more than happy to send these presentations to anyone who's interested. And um, uh, again, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thanks for having me up. If there's, I have one minute for questions, if there are any. Good morning. Great presentation. Thank you. My name is Gordana Slepchev. I'm uh, with Lomico Metals. What is your outlook on graphite? Um, the good news for graphite is that if you build a gigafactory today, 
it is almost impossible. It is very expensive to change that factory. So you'll hear the, ter the term drop-in technology. There's no such thing. Uh, the, even if we, you went from an upgraded nickel product, uh, a, a 622, 60 percent nickel to an 811, 80 nickel, the cost for a gigafactory at minimum is $300 million. So when people talk about they have a drop-in technology to replace graphite, um, that's not going to happen. Um, so for anything that's being built that uses graphite, it most likely will continue to use graphite for the life of the area. Um, there are quite a few graphite, uh, both um, uh, synthetic and natural graphite projects out there. And the pricing, the Chinese are pretty tough on, on pricing in that industry. So the good news is there's going to be a lot of demand. All these new factories being built today are going to use graphite with some silicon additive. Um, uh, the, the negative would be there's a lot of people looking into this industry and in terms of getting energy density, you will start to see silicon anodes, full silicon anodes, probably hit the market in 2025, 2026. Mercedes has a commercially announced a deal with, uh, with solid power to have a silicon anode out there. And we do see, and I always like to look at China, there's quite a bit of silicon anode uh, EVs over there today. And that, what, what tends to happen with the technology is that the Chinese just put the technology out there. Like there's not this long, they just do it. And then they sort of figure out what to do from there. The OEMs who operate in China then need to sort of compete. And so they quickly go there. So, um, and then, then that sort of spreads quickly to the rest of the world. So from a graphite, the important thing, and we always tell people this, win the contract with the cell plant. Never be a merchant supplier to this industry. So if you win that contract with that gigafactory, you'll pretty much have a life of the facility type of contract because there's gonna be a lot of tweaks, even though the, they won't change from graphite, there'll be 3% to 4% silicon or 6% silicon or this type of additive, and they'll have to work with you. So if you win that contract, that's really positive. I would not be a company who's saying, I'm gonna low cost graphite producer, come to me. Because we've already seen Johnson Matthey in Europe say, oh, we're gonna be a low cost cathode producer, it's a slightly different part of the value chain spend 700 million US to build a plant with no customers, and then they found out they didn't have any customers and they had to write the whole thing off. So don't, we always tell people, don't make an investment unless you have a customer. Once you have the customer, make the investment, and, and particularly in such a fast moving industry, that's going to be it. Now, will we move eventually away from graphite? Yes, um, but again, that could be a very long tail and, and really have good opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. That's a great presentation. Believe me, you will be back uh, many different forums. Ken is a great speaker, very knowledgeable, obviously, with McKinsey in the background, putting a lot of resources into this topic. Um, thank you again, Joanne, for inviting the guest, and thank, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry, for your participation and your support. <laughs>